I want to be that servant that says, here am I, Lord. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to give. I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to have your perspective on all matters. And um, researchers tell us that regularly, even daily, doing a crossword puzzle helps our brain work better longer. How many of you have heard of that? How many of you do that? I do that. I have a little uh, crossword puzzle on my phone, and so I try that. They have about five or six letters, and you have to use just those letters to form the words. And uh, so a lot of times I breeze right through it. And then sometimes I'm thinking, what in the world is that word? What is that word? But there's a little button there they give you that you can rearrange the order of the letters. And then it's like, well, let's hit it again. Uh, all right, hit it again. Hit it a few times and all of a sudden it's like, voila, there it is. I see it now and it's like, why didn't I see that earlier? But I got a different perspective on it. And I want to preach to you this morning a message about perspective. About seeing things from God's perspective. We all have our own take, do we not? We have our own perspective and sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. And we don't always see things as they really are and we oftentimes miss seeing things as God sees them. That's why we have the Bible, so we can look at life from God's perspective. His ways are higher than our ways. His ways are oftentimes, from our perspective, past finding out. We don't always know God's ultimate designs for our lives. But we know this. We can trust the one who does know. We can rest in the God of heaven and hold fast to his promises. And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me in God's word to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 37. And I want you to find a, your place here as we begin. Genesis 37. One writer said, as you read the life of Joseph, you see in him a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was greatly loved by his father, hated and envied by his brothers, plotted against, sold as a slave, arrested unjustly, and made to suffer. But he went from suffering to glory and became the savior of the people who had rejected him. I want you to think about how God worked in Joseph's life to bring him to such a place of opportunity and blessing to his family and to the whole world even at that time. Egypt became the bread basket for the world in a time of great famine, but God was preparing his servant all along. See, God sees the end from the beginning and everything in between. God knows what he's doing, and he knows what the need is going to be even years from now. God knew what the need would be in this hour years ago. God has been preparing you, preparing your family, preparing our church for his eternal purposes according to his divine plan. And as I think about Joseph, here he was in Genesis 37 as a 17-year-old boy, a young man, a teenager in verse 2, and just a young man who was sincere in his love for God, his dad, his brothers, but because his father favored him, his brothers, the Bible says, hated him in verse 4, so much so they couldn't even talk to him. They just ignored him and they tried to leave him alone, but he dreamed a dream that one day his brothers would bow before him and uh, they didn't take to that dream very well. And the Bible says in verse 11, and his brethren envied him but his father observed the same. His brethren went out to feed their flocks or the father's flock in Sheshem, the Bible says in verse 12. And then Joseph's dad, Jacob, also known as Israel, sent him to go check on them in verse 13 and 14. 
And as he was going to find them, the Bible says in verse 15, a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked, saying, What seest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, There departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. That's about 20 miles north from where he was. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them. And they what? Conspired against him to slay him. I mean, they were not only just aggravated with this young man, their kid brother. They hated that boy. They were so jealous of him. They thought we're going to finish him off and destroy him altogether from the face of this earth. And some of us have felt that wrath coming from others, but God somehow intervened and preserved us, and that's exactly what God did here for Joseph. I want you to notice here in verse 20. Let's read it together. The Bible says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Underline that. What will become of his dreams? Huh. He's told us about all these things going to happen. If we finish him off, these dreams aren't going to come to pass and we're definitely not going to kneel before him and show reverence and respect one day. Wow. That's not going to happen. I'll tell you what, I'm glad there's a God in heaven and we know the rest of the story. And there is a story yet that is unfolded. And I want you to write some things down this morning about perspective and how God works and who God uses even to get us to where we need to be in the doing of His will. And we've got to see it from God's angle. God uses, at times, jealous brothers or jealous people. I want you to write that down, number one. God uses people who just don't like us. And by the way, have you learned that in life? There are some people who just don't like you. I don't care how hard you try, they're never going to like you. I don't care how much you do and how much you try to impress them, they're just not going to like you. There are some people who need everyone's approval. And they are the most vexed, miserable people you'll meet in this life. Because you can't get that in a fallen world. There are people that don't like you sometimes because you like them and you're good to them. And uh, they're not used to people being good to them. They have a totally different take on life, a different perspective altogether. And uh, they look at you in ways that you have never even thought. You've given them personally no reason to be jealous of you or envious of you as far as you can tell in your mind, but yet they are. Sometimes they look at you and they see in you what they wanted in themselves. And you have it and they don't. There's all kinds of reasons why people are envious of, of us and jealous of us along the way. And we've got to come to this place of where we learn to rest in the Lord and trust in God and know that God is in control. And we are just desiring in our lives to please Him more than anyone else. What's our theme for this year? One, two, please. One to please. I hope you've written that down. One to please. Nothing to prove. One to please. We want to please our God. We want to honor Him. When you please God, it doesn't matter who's not pleased with you. And there will be those who are not pleased with you. Write this down, if you will. The ones who plot against us actually work for us. God uses them to touch our lives, to teach us more about Himself, and even at times to take hold of us like they did, and we'll see here. Notice this. The Bible goes on further in verse 22. Let's read that. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And so one was going to try to deliver him, but yet 
God was still superintending this, and it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of the coat, that coat of many colors that was upon him, that was the coat that his father made that made them even more envious. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Now, I want you to underline this in verse 25, a company of Ishmaelites. Sometimes God uses jealous brothers. Sometimes He uses someone out of the blue, someone we've never met, someone in our lives. This is what struck me about this passage here, is that here they were plotting how to get rid of him, but yet God was going to get Joseph down into Egypt. Remember that? And... Uh, and so, out of the blue comes this band of Ishmaelites. And it's like, here they are. It's like, well, let's just sell him to these guys. They happen to be going to Egypt, right? They happen to be going exactly to where God was trying to get Joseph. And yet, God was superintending all of this. There are people that God moves in and out of our lives, and they sometimes for us, we don't know them, never met them. We wonder how it happened that they're in our path. And then all of a sudden we realize that literally they are someone from out of the blue, from out of the sky, out of heaven. God sent them in to our lives. It's a powerful reminder as to who God is and how God sovereignly is working on our behalf. All of a sudden there's this band and they're going down to Egypt, and God's going to use them to take Joseph there. Number one, jealous brothers, the ones who plot against us actually work for us. Number two, someone out of the blue. God uses natural things in life to accomplish his supernatural purposes, the common for the uncommon. Look for God in it. This is just a band of Ishmaelites that happened to be there. Descendants of Ishmael, those that are interchangeably known as the Midianites also, the son of Abraham and Keturah, his concubine after Sarah died. And so this was like a nation within a nation used interchangeably here in this text. But God was behind it all. God used this common, ordinary, natural people just Hey, we're going down to Egypt. We're going to sell some of these things we got here. Well, what do you think about our brother? You want him? Well, how much you want for him? And they thought, we'll take him and we'll get him to Egypt and sell him once we get there. Amazing, is it not? But God's purpose and plan is unfolding yet. Look with me over in Genesis chapter 39. This is powerful. I love the story of Joseph. Genesis 39, I want you to write this down. Jealous brothers, someone out of the blue, God can use a high-ranking officer. The Bible says in verse 1 of this chapter, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, perhaps over like his secret service, the ones who would guard the Pharaoh himself, an Egyptian brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which brought him down thither. Underline that, which brought him down thither. God was trying to get Joseph into Egypt, right? There God was going to not only raise him up and use him, but God was going to birth, forge a nation, the nation of Israel, the very apple of his eye. God was at work here. So unusual. My brothers hate me. I mean... Who are these people? How did I ever end up here? You ever been there? I never thought this, Lord. I thought when I sincerely yielded my life to do your will, I really thought that it would just all kind of come together and make sense for me. A lot of times it's not going to make sense for you. In fact, it's going to make no sense at all at times. But it's in those moments where we're not only going to have to trust God, but we can. Trust God. God is trustworthy. You can count on God to always be who he's always been, to do what he has said he will do. 
And God used this high-ranking officer. But I want you to notice something here in these verses and circle them. I've circled them here in this chapter. Verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, and the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Notice verse 5, and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and the blessing of the, say it, the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Again, this continues to unfold. The Bible says, as Potiphar's wife falsely accused him, in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. He was cast in a prison. But notice verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the, the Lord made it to prosper. Don't ever leave God out of the equation of your life. Don't leave God out of the equation of your present circumstance. It is the Lord who makes all the difference. Jehovah, the self-existent one, the true living God of heaven has a purpose and a plan in your life. He may use jealous people. He may use someone out of the blue you've never met before and think, wow, how did this kind of happen. How did we meet? God can use a high-ranking officer, someone in some kind of capacity in life. God can use someone who is just a false accuser. See, that's how Joseph ended up in prison, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. I want to tell you, if you're going to do something for God, Not everybody's going to sing your praise. They're not only going to be those who are envious of you, but they're going to be those who rail against you and try to discredit you, diminish you, dismiss you, destroy you. Falsely accused. I don't know what's going on in your life today, but I want to tell you, there's a God in heaven. And we think if we're in God's will, everybody's happy. Everybody is going to celebrate it. That's not true. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. We all have a measure of pride and self-will in us. That's our sin nature. Isn't that right? And when we feel slighted and someone else acknowledged or elevated, sometimes not only does that jealousy kick in, but that desire to tear down. And to falsely accuse. I'll tell you, that's one of the hardest things to bear when you know, as best you know, you've tried to do right. And someone is alleging that you've done wrong. Have you ever been falsely accused? Totally misunderstood. Totally misrepresented. See, it's about perspective. How many times I've thought as a pastor, I thought, if they could just see my heart. And the Lord reminds me that they can't. See, that's one reason why we don't want to leave God out of our situations because we can't see other people's hearts. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 7 that we're to judge not. The word judge there means that we're not to condemn others. We're not to write them off and, and, and just chalk it up and say, but I know your heart. No, you don't. But I know you well enough to know what's going on here. You might think you do, but you don't. There's a different perspective. You know, I think this is something that could change all of our lives for the glory of God and our own good, as well as so many others this year. Maybe there's something here I'm not seeing. The Bible warns us against evil surmisings. That means drawing a conclusion based upon inaccurate or insufficient information. 
There will always be that variable that we don't know the heart. We don't really know what's going on inside of that person. That's where we have to trust God. Even when Shimei cursed David and David's servant wanted to just take him out, David said, no, wait. God said to Shimei, curse David. I want to tell you, that's a hard place to get to where you can trust God even when you are falsely accused or cursed or become the lightning rod of someone's wrath and anger against God and their lives. The life that they've lived and the circumstances that have unfolded for them. Wow. That can be an amazing thing. Now here's Joseph, a heart for God, a heart for his dad, his brethren, willing to do what is right to help his family, to help his dad. He's going to check on his brothers. They plot against him. And then they end up selling him into slavery. Just putting him in the hands of someone who would take him and put that in motion. Here he was at Potiphar's house. But you know what? This is something that as I studied this that God reminded me of. It wasn't just that God got him to Egypt. We say that sometimes in a more broad way. God got Joseph down to Egypt. But God got Joseph not only down to Egypt, but he got him right to Potiphar's house where he would be falsely accused. God orchestrated that. I'll tell you, you can include God in every circumstance of your life. And if you're reeling this morning because someone has misunderstood you, misinterpreted your words or your actions or misrepresented it in their mind or to someone else or even back to you, you can rest assured that there's still a God in heaven who knows your heart. And if he's allowed it, he's got a purpose, a reason behind it. God is at work in your life. God knows what he's doing, and you can trust him. God didn't get Joseph down there and it's like, well, hey, I'm here in Egypt. What am I doing here? He got him there in Potiphar's house so that he would be falsely accused, so from there he would get him into the prison so he would be there with the baker and the butler. He would interpret their dreams. And then the butler who was delivered would forget all about him. <laughs> For two years he would still wait in that prison. But you know what? We have the word of God to hold to. Joseph, in his day, the equivalent was a dream directly from God. It was God's word. It was God's promise that God had a plan. So he just kept trusting God. Wherever he went, he made the most of it. God made him to prosper. He just flourished there in Potiphar's house. He flourished there in the prison. He did his best wherever he was. And that's what God wants to do for all of us. God knows where we're at. God knows what he's doing. God has a purpose and God has a plan. We can trust in him. The God who set the sun, moon, and stars in place sets us in the place of his choosing for such a time as this. God sets us in the place of his choosing. Do we believe that this morning? I believe it with my whole heart. God can use a high-ranking officer. God can use even a false accuser. But write this principle down. The deeper the hurt or the injustice you face in life, the greater the compassion God will give you for others. Now it stings, it hurts, it burns sometimes if we're not careful. If we leave God out, see, it will harden us. But if we invite God into the situation, God will use it to tender our hearts, to humble our hearts, and to give us a greater compassion. I face a lot of deep hurt in my life. And you know what it's done? Oh, it could have hard me. I could be such a jaded fellow right now. Oh, my, so cynical, so bitter, so mad. 
I could easily be there today. But somehow, along the way, I thought, wait. I believe there's a God. And I believe He's in control. And I believe that somehow if I'll deal with this in faith, that means include God in it, the Lord. You see, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Don't leave God out of it. Say, God, teach me. Lord, what are you doing? Help me to trust you. Oh, Lord, help me to be more like you. Help me to rely upon you. Lord, I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to be falsely accused. Well, who would want to, right? <laughs> it was all a part of God's unfolding plan, his will for Joseph and his life, but not just for Joseph. It was for all of his family and all of his people for a new nation as well as the Egyptians and beyond. God was at work. God's at work in your life. He knows what he's doing. God wants to deepen your capacity to love him and to love others, to look beyond their fault and see their true need, not to be petty or vindictive or just to shoot back when someone takes a pot shot at you or just somehow diminishes you or tries to discredit you. Give that to God and be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what God wants. God knows what he's doing. And I don't know where you're at and what you're facing, but I'll tell you another person God uses is that forgetful butler. People, they said they would help us, but they never came through. You ever been in a situation like that? You've had people who said, I'll be there for you if you need me, let me know. And then all of a sudden you got up against the wall, you were hard pressed and you called them and it's like, oh. I remember one day someone told me they were going to do something a little while past and I came back to them and I said, you know, are you still able to do what you said? And, and I didn't ask them for that. They just offered it to me. They said, this is what I'm going to do to help you in this area. And they said, did I say that? I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, well, I don't think if I did say that, that that's what I meant. Here's where I really meant. And I thought, wow, that's a bummer. And you know what? There are people going to tell you all kinds of things they'll do, but they'll forget you. Even God is still sovereign in those times. You know what? Instead of telling they were about him when he got right back out of prison, this butler, the Bible says clearly that he forgot Joseph. You know why he forgot? I believe sometimes God causes people to forget. Because as sure as he causes them to forget, in his time, when his purpose is about to be fulfilled and unveiled before us, then God causes them to remember. There's a time when the Pharaoh had a dream, remember? And he was thinking, whoa, what is this? And nobody could tell him. And then the butler thinks, whoa, wait a minute. I know this, this young man that was in prison with us. And he told me and the baker what would happen. And just as he said, it happened. And the Pharaoh said, go get him. Go get him. And he told the Pharaoh about these years of plenty and then these years of famine and how there need to be preparation. And the Pharaoh said, is there anyone in the kingdom so wise as you in whom the spirit of the gods is in from his perspective? And he said, I'm going to put you in charge of all of this. You'll be second only to me in all the kingdom. Everyone else will do what you tell them to do. God exalted Joseph. Now get this, it's powerful. The Bible says that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. People may forget us, but God will always remember us. He's not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, Hebrews 6.10 says. God has a purpose in our pain. God has a purpose in all the different twists and turns of our lives. In God's time, God can bring us back to the memory or the forefront of someone's thinking or life. Look with me in Genesis chapter 45 here. It's a powerful passage because Joseph by now, years have passed. 
He's revealing himself to his brethren. They don't even recognize him at first. You think about all the time as it passed. Joseph, when he left, was 17. At this stage of his life, he's 39. 22 years have passed. His own brothers didn't recognize him. But he revealed himself to them. And the Bible says he wept aloud in verse 2. He says in verse 3, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? Oh, how he yearned upon his dad, no doubt. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. The word troubled here literally means they were terrified. (laughs) They were shaken in their boots. They were scared to death. This was the one that we got rid of. I mean, we hated so much we were going to kill. And, uh, and finally we thought, well, we'll show him some mercy, but we'll send him so far away we'll never hear from him again. And we'll go and take that coat of many colors and dip it in animal's blood and, and we'll go to our father and he'll be convinced that he's gone. And he was. Jacob said about his son Joseph, he is without a doubt, without a doubt, no doubt about it, he's dead. He's gone. There are times in our lives when we think there is no hope for this situation. There is no hope for me. Without a doubt whatsoever, I'm finished. It's done for. It's over. But the Lord, but the Lord, you can trust him. Notice what the Bible says as this unfolded. Jesus uh, Or Joseph in verse number four said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither for God did send me before you to preserve life. You sold me, but God sent me. See, I dealt with it in faith. I gave it to God. I trusted God. I held to that dream he gave me, to his word. I knew that he was working somehow, though I didn't understand it, though I I could have never even imagined this. This was God's purpose and God's plan. Every step of the way, jealousy, people out of the blue, people in positions of authority or power, false accusers, people who forgot about me, all of that is a part of my story that God used step by step to get me right here to preserve you and your little ones and so many others. You sold me, but God sent me. Isn't it powerful? He said, for these Two years hath the famine been of the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God, underline that, verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Right away he's reassuring them. He said, be not grieved. Wait, fellas, let's let's not even go right now as to what happened. I, I don't want to rehash all that. I've given that to God. I loved you then. I love you now. I dealt with this in faith. And look what God has done. God had a purpose. And it is right before our very eyes. You know, I'm glad we can trust God in this, aren't you? We can trust God. Whatever we're facing, whatever's working against us, whoever's working against us, we can trust God. If you'll turn to chapter 49... The Bible talks about Joseph and how he was a fruitful before God. The Bible says in verse 23, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But here he was still bearing fruit. Amazing, isn't it? People hated him. They tried every way they could to destroy him. But God, the Lord, preserved him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd 
the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father hath prevailed above the blessings of thy progenitors or your ancestors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Oh, sometimes we feel so left out, so forgotten, so abandoned and forsaken. But God, God has a purpose in our pain. God's plan is unfolding and we can trust him to do what he's determined in his time. In the service of the Lord, the greater the blessing, the greater the price, the greater the reward. You say, Lord, I really want you to use my life. Well, the, to the extent that God will use your life in direct proportion of that will be times of proving, even times of pain, a price to pay. As one writer Stated, Joseph was the vine that went over the walls separating Jews and Gentiles. He was shot at by his brethren, which often happens to those who are especially blessed of God. But the Lord was with him, strengthened him, and extended his boundaries of blessing. Joseph suffered, and his sons were blessed by God. Reuben sinned, and his sons lost the blessing of God. I want to tell you what. There's a lot of our stories that have not been fully written nor revealed yet I'll tell you what is the most important part of your story in mind today and that's the way it ends the last chapter 2021 we're writing another chapter right yes. this might be my conclusion I don't know it might be yours but I'll tell you in life it's not how you start it's how you finish we can finish well and we can finish strong by just trusting God. You say, well, I'm put to the worst. I'm up against it. I don't know what I'm going to face. I don't know what our country's facing. God knows. And we can trust him. We can rest in him. He knows where we're at. He knows exactly what he's doing in each of our lives. In chapter 50 here, the Bible says, it's an amazing verse. I want you to think of it. Chapter number 50, just look there. The Bible says in verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. Yes, you did indeed. But God, there it is again, underline that. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God meant it unto good. What perspective do you have on your trouble, your trial, someone else's life even? Just remind yourself, you don't always see the whole picture. You never see the heart. Only God could see that. Are there different perspectives that God can give you? Yes. You just need to be mindful that there are other angles and maybe from your angle what you're seeing is not enough to determine what's going on in that person's life or even in the dynamic of your relationship with that person. Why don't you step back and say, God, help me to see this from another angle. Give me your perspective on the matter. Lord, help me to see it like you see it. I'll tell you what, it'll change your life for good for the glory of God and the blessing of others. We ought to love people enough to give them the benefit of the doubt, to deal with them in good faith and in good will, to let God be the judge. You know what I've learned about people? You can give them to God. Have you ever done that? And as God does deal with them, God preserves 
and protects his servant. Do you believe that this morning? Do we believe this? Do we believe that God is sovereignly in control and God is preparing a people? He's been preparing this church. I am convinced for such a time as this, what is our part? What is our role? To be a voice for God, to be the salt and the light that God wants us to be in our city and beyond. This is our hour. This is our opportunity. We're going to meet God with it one day. God has had a plan all these years and has brought us to this place. And God, wants to pour out his blessing upon us. I'll tell you, a nation divided needs a church united. Everyone praying together, working together, believing God, trusting God that he's God. There's nothing uh, too hard for him. And he is able and his grace is sufficient. We're going to trust him come what may. Because in the service of the Lord, the greater the blessing, the greater the price. The greater the price, the greater the reward. The ones who plot against us actually work for us. God uses the natural things in life to accomplish his supernatural purposes. The God who set the sun, moon, and stars in place has set us in the place, this place of his choosing for such a time as this. The deeper the hurt or injustice, the greater the compassion. And people may forget us, but God will always remember us. Let's stand with our heads bowed before the Lord. God knows who we are and God knows exactly where we are. God knows what he's doing. We can trust him. We can trust him. And I don't know what God is dealing with you about. There may be someone in your life. It may be some circumstance in your life. You need to just come and trust God with that person or that situation. Say, Lord, I am going to trust you. Give me faith and give me grace to just keep going and doing what's right. Though I'm aggravated at times, provoked at times, even distraught perhaps. God, I'm going to trust this person or this situation to you. Give me grace and give me victory and peace. How do you think Joseph survived being the servant there in Potiphar's house? Falsely accused, in prison. How did he survive all that? How did he stay separated from the dad that he loved so much all those years? How did he survive it? Faith in God. Faith in God. And some of us need to come and say, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Oh God, I give myself and my situation to you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, it's my prayer and all of our prayer that you'll know him believing that he died for you and rose again on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He died on the cross to forgive your sin, to pay the penalty for your sin so you wouldn't have to. Would you trust him today? You can trust him right where you are. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Please save me for Christ's sake. He'll forgive you. He'll save you, friend, if you'll call upon his name.